Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on The Cognitive Crucible is Thomas Kent, who teaches and consults on Russian affairs, journalism, and the problems of propaganda and disinformation. President of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty until 2018, he now teaches at Columbia University and consults for governments, non-governmental organizations, and news organizations. He is also a senior fellow of the Jamestown Foundation and associate fellow of Slovakia's GlobeSec. Tom Kent, welcome back to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you. Nice to be here. I think uh, you, you, this is this is your third appearance on the Cognitive Crucible. I think we're going to have to, you know, uh, look at getting you like a, a gold jacket or something like that, or or or, or maybe that's only for uh, people who have been back five times, which <laughs> which no one has. But anyway, you're 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 on track to to getting the Cognitive Crucible gold jacket. I would say. Well, maybe the third time's the charm. That's right. That's right. Uh, so um, uh, the conversation I'd like to have with you today, Tom, is going to be your new book on how Russia loses, which is a fascinating title. But uh, as usual, I uh, ask guests um, if we could start by getting your assessment of our current strategic landscape or if you prefer the times in which we live. Well, we live in complicated times. I think um, as an information person, that information is really key to the strategic landscape. So I think that the success of uh, Western nations is very closely tied to their information strategies and what successes our adversaries have are closely tied to their information strategies. There are things like uh, foreign aid uh, and, uh, uh, and, and and various kinds of uh, concrete help uh, that, that play a role in influencing people around the world. But it seems to me that information has been and will continue to be the key battlefield. Right, right. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to uh, talk about your new book. And the full title is How Russia Loses Hubris and Miscalculation in Putin's Kremlin. And by the way, to our audience, um, we will have a link to this book in the show notes. And um, uh, this is, well, t t tell us about this book, please, Tom. Sure. Well, um, I started from the idea that, um, uh, that Putin's efforts to build influence abroad have succeeded in many places. And that has led some to see him as this master tactician whose skills are practically unbeatable. Um, this book takes a more skeptical approach, and it argues that Russian influence operations have also been plagued by overconfidence, by misjudgments, uh, which often repeat themselves in case after case. So what I did was look at six case studies where Russian fortunes under Putin suffered temporary uh, reversals or long-term reversals and the reasons for those setbacks, uh, which range from Russia's own weaknesses to nimble responses by Western countries and pro-democracy actors in, in various nations. Um, it's probably a bit counterintuitive when the world is in such turmoil as it is now, and some chips are falling the Kremlin's way, to think about weaknesses and in their influence operations. But to me, that makes it perhaps more important to focus on the kinds of miscalculations they do make and how these can be recognized and exploited uh, in what will still be a long game of influence. Mm, right. Uh, you, you seem careful to uh, be using the word influence rather than information operations. Is, is there... I mean, talk about that just a little bit. 
Sure. Influence can be a lot of things. It can be information operations. It can be the application of military force. It can be official statements. It can be the delivery of aid. Um, it can be uh, suborning politicians. It could it could be um, um, uh, posting up uh, uh, posters or, or slogans on walls. Um, it, 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 there's a great variety of things that um, that uh, constitute influence. So mm -hmm. I tried to um, look at all aspects of influence, but again and again, and this is just part of my view of the strategic picture, uh, information played a big role in almost every one of these case studies. Right, right. And um, to our audience, just uh, especially to future audiences, um, uh, we are recording this in the middle of November of 2023. So if you happen to be listening to, listening to this a year from now or two years from now, uh, you know, just please keep in mind that uh, date marker as things could possibly change. So your book, there's uh, six different case studies that you that you use to uh, illuminate this. Um, how did you choose these six different case studies? Well, I looked for a geographical spread uh, to begin with, and then I looked for a variety of influence operations, some of which involved trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, how to get the uh, uh, how to build Russian influence in individual countries uh, with a goal of, of capturing essentially those countries or Russia's side, and also operations uh, that were not related to one country specifically, but to broader issues. Uh, one of those, for example, is the, the Russians' effort to popularize the uh, Sputnik COVID vaccine, which they developed, or to promote the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So those were those were operations that involved influence in in many countries, not just not just uh, one. But I can, if mm -hmm. you like, just sort of list what the yeah yeah what, sure what the uh, case studies are. Right. The first one was Ukraine, and uh, it, with Ukraine, I was interested in the period from the time that Putin became president to the time that he invaded. Um, during this period, uh, at the at the very beginning in Ukraine. Uh, when, when Putin came to power, uh, he was actually the most popular politician there, according to people I talked to who were uh, very familiar with the situation at that time. So Ukraine was his to lose. And over 22 years, he basically lost it. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at, at, at how, he, how he managed to run a reverse influence operation to make Russia more and more unpopular in that country. Then another one, uh, turning to South America, is Ecuador the reign of President Rafael Correa from 2007 to 2017, a close ally of Moscow uh, in, in, in some ways, um, but uh, succeeded by a, um, a new president who totally turned around Ecuador and turned it totally toward the United States and, and the West. So how did that happen? And, and, and what kind of reversal for Russia was that? Then I looked at South Africa under the presidency of Jacob Zuma from 2009 to 2018, another mm. very, very close ally of Russia, um, but um, brought down uh, by, by civil society organizations, by the judiciary uh, over corruption issues, and particularly brought down by Putin himself, who uh, tried with Zuma to uh, engineer an enormous nuclear power deal that would have, that was so expensive that it would have made um, South Africa, an economic vassal of Russia for, for decades to come. Uh, then I looked at North Macedonia uh, from 2018 to 2019. There was a, um, there was a, a crisis there because of um, a desire uh, by, by pro-Western forces in North Macedonia to make some constitutional changes that would enable North Macedonia to join the EU and NATO the Russians mounted a very strong campaign against that, the Russians and their allies. Um, and the West mounted a surprisingly strong campaign in favor of these constitutional changes, which eventually went through. And then there was the, the COVID vaccine, uh, which the Russians began um, uh, introducing in 2020, trying to make it sort of the, the world standard 
and they came close, except for some serious problems, which which in the end made Sputnik basically a footnote among world uh, COVID vaccines. And then their efforts to promote the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which now um, lies uh, destroyed and, and unusable, but uh, more broadly, you know, was it ever necessary at all? Uh, and uh, what success would Russia ever have had in getting it operating, even if there hadn't been its invasion of Ukraine? Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, that is uh, quite, quite, quite a spread there. How how did you go about deciding in the first place? Well, I mean, so, so you know, Russia doesn't announce to the world attention. Uh, we are uh, going to be engaging in an influence operation. Uh, I just wanted to let you know. Okay, everybody, proceed about your your daily lives. Um, how, how did you actually identify? Uh, uh, influence campaigns that were, well, f- first of all, how, how did you do that? And then how did you prioritize which ones to actually put into the book? Well, I was looking for campaigns where the Russians use wide varieties of tools, where they tried to um, uh, snuggle up to to various top power brokers, which is something they, they quite commonly do. Um, the um, uh, I, I looked at, at situations where um, they um, failed, as, as they often do, to prioritize public diplomacy uh, and foreign aid. I looked for situations where they they overestimate their own strength, which happens a lot, uh, where they underestimate the strength of democratic institutions, civil society, um, and where they underestimate the, the strength of Western nations. And and for areas where, you know, particularly in, in cases like North Macedonia and um, the Nord Stream pipeline, where the West was actually quite aggressive and uh, used information tools and legislation and, and all sorts of uh, means of influence to upend what Russia wanted to accomplish. Mm. Well, so surely your time with... Um... Uh, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, you know, must help inform your investigations here, right? You, you must have like some kind of a uh, uh, antenna or like sniffer or something which helps you ferret out, you know, uh, these various different dynamics. Um, uh, you know, well, first of all, is that true? And then second of all, what, how can other people develop that kind of, um, of uh, uh, intuition without, you know, spending their professional life in, in, in that kind of environment, like at, at Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty? Maybe the biggest lesson uh, I took away from Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty was not specifically the the, the work that we did, but the people um, who supported us in various countries. And what I'm talking about is civil society organizations, uh, uh, progressive movements of various sorts, um, environmental groups, um, uh, women's uh, empowerment movements. Uh, all of these actors in at-risk countries, if you want to call them that, mm. that um, are allies of, of anyone who promotes freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and so forth. It's a, it's a pretty big um, uh, range uh, of actors in, in, in countries that, uh, uh, where, where there's a struggle going on between authoritarian and democratic tendencies. And I became, through my work at RFERL, I became aware of these groups and had opportunities to, to work with them, which I, which I continue to do. Um, they have a lot of problems we can talk about if, if, you, if you want. Um, uh, they need a lot of help. Um, but they are local, authentic, uh, believable actors uh, who um, engage in all sorts of mainly information work. Uh, and who uh, who authoritarians are terribly afraid of, judging by all the efforts that authoritarian actors make to try to shut down civil society, to try to limit 
their ability to um, uh, get their messages out. Uh, it's clear that that when you're dealing with any kind of authoritarian politician or regime, the thing they fear most is freedom of information. And that is what these civil society organizations stand for. Mm, mm, right. So we, we've had, um, well, you, you previously in your last appearance here, that was episode 105 on persuasion in the developing world. And of course, we'll have a link in the show notes to this. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there's another episode that we had with a, a gentleman named Dan Rundy, who um, uh, passed along some similar sentiments, I believe. But uh, Dan in particular uh, asserted that that we, the United States in in this case, but maybe Western societies in general, have been asleep at the switch in the developing world and have uh, you know really provided an opportunity for. Russia and China and other actors, presumably, to fill a void. Um, I don't recall exactly what your opinion was on that, but could could you comment on that, especially in the context of uh, uh, your most recent work here? Sure. Um, I think that uh, Western nations as a whole, including the United States, have been very reluctant to conduct large-scale information operations. Mm. And there's a, there, there are a bunch of reasons for it. One is uh, insecurity about the story that the West has to tell, you know, mm. uh, as in, you know, who are we to prescribe anything for the rest of the world since, you know, our societies are not what we would like them to be. Um, I think we have a revulsion sort of uh, in our DNA uh, toward engaging in propaganda, we don't we don't like the word propaganda when we're talking about ourselves. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is that a, a lot of people in the West believe that if we engage in 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 any kind of information warfare, uh, it's going to inevitably turn into disinformation from our side, which I don't think is true, but that's a a common fear. Um, people uh, are. Uh, uh, I, I think we've lost some of the tradecraft uh, capabilities that we had mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. during the Cold War and, and even the, the fight against Islamic extremism. Um, so um, uh, we wind up in this situation where we wind up, you know, sending in the army or doing, you know, economic sanctions or other things that, that look aggressive and can be clumsy and, and, and slow to yield success. When information, as I'm sure everyone who listens to this podcast would agree, is one of the cheapest, most effective things that you can do. Hmm. Yeah, right. I want to try to bring in a, another uh, podcast that we did uh, quite some time ago now, but it really is one of my uh, favorites. And I think that there's a touch point here, but it's going to take me just just a moment to unpack it just a little bit. But we had a great discussion with a fellow named Alan Kelly, um, and he created what he calls his, uh, like a, a taxonomy of influence or a, a taxonomy of plays. And we'll have a link to this in the show notes as well. But um, he, he developed what what looks like a um like a like a periodic table of of influence techniques and he has a whole bunch of like interesting names or or engaging names for these various different ways of engaging with people and um uh influencing them like from you know probing like you know, uh, 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 like um activities that are considered like probing or framing or diverting or provoking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, uh, Alan and Chris Paul did a really neat study where they um, they overlaid these tiles or these these plays on top of uh, Russia's or or Putin's 2014 Crimea campaign. You know, with the little green men, et cetera, et cetera. But when Putin did this, they labeled it like a a, dec a declarative play. And when Putin did this, they they labeled it as a call out 
play, right? And so um, uh, my my question becomes, do, do you think it's possible, Tom, to take uh, the book that you just wrote and the six different case studies, and I, I, I think it would be a super interesting project for a, a student or somebody to basically um, – uh, like re repeat the the analysis that Alan Kelly and Chris Paul did with these six different case studies as well, and overlay these these tiles or these plays onto the activities that are associated with all six of these case studies, and and start developing you know something that could be thought of as like a, a process model of typical uh, like Russian influence uh, campaigns. Um, let me just ask you to respond to that in, in whatever way you think is productive. Sure. Um, this taxonomy of influence strategies um, is, is very effective. It's got, what, uh, 20 or so uh, different mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, diff different approaches, you know, disclose, concede, declare, deflect, uh, uh, preempt, challenge, bait, uh, they're, they're all uh, uh, very effective um, information techniques. Uh, you could actually make them into an information operations card game if you wanted. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ga right. ga Gaming is a big thing too, right? It. it uh, uh, I. I. I really do suggest to our, our audience. You know, go uh, there. There'll be a link in the show notes. But go. Go and check this thing out. And as as you go from like left to right across this taxonomy the way alan described it to me is like you know on the left hand side the the uh, plays as he calls them are more oh gosh i i don't quite remember well it, on the on the chart he he calls it you know on the left hand side they're they're more like conditioning and then in the middle of the chart they're more controlling and then on the right hand side of the chart they're 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 more confronting or more like in your face, right? And so you, you can kind of think of them as going from left to right to being like um, like uh, 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 engagements that would be more civil to all the way over to the other side to engagements that would be like hostile potentially. Right, and I, I would just add though that these techniques um, are can be used in any direction by anyone. Uh, information mm -hmm. techniques are like a rifle, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tool that can be fired by anyone. Right. So uh, in addition to saying, oh, you know, look at the Russians, they use all these techniques. Uh, we should be saying, well, which of these can we use? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I don't think that any of these techniques necessarily, you know, even though the Russians use them, I don't think any of these <laughs> techniques is, is um, uh, immoral uh, in, in themselves. Uh, it depends to who uses them and and to what and to what end. Um, and I think that we have this um, sort of reflexive fear of uh, you know words like you know psychological warfare uh, just to scare everybody to death uh, in the West. But you know I mean a commercial for on, on TV for an automobile is 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 psychological uh, operation. So I, I I just don't see why. Um, uh, why some of these can't be used, provided that mm -hmm. we are uh, using these in the in the service of, uh, of, 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 of encouraging honest uh, democratic governments and that we tell the truth. Um, you know, when I think about my tombstone, you know, which we should all do at some point. OK, uh, yeah. what, what my tombstone will say is. We should always tell the truth. But there's a lot of truth to tell. Mm. And I think that um, uh, disinformation, you know, actually making things up is, is a bad path, except maybe in some limited tactical situation, particularly like, like military uh, uh, deception. Um, but there is so much to say and do in favor of, um, uh, of, uh, of free societies. A lot of people, I think, in the West um, sort of stop as I indicated before and said, well, our societies, you know, aren't that great. So who are we to, to lecture mm -hmm. others? Mm -hmm. But but my point is that um, uh, we're not asking people to say the United States is great. We want to be just like the United States. We're asking people to look at what democratic freedoms could mean in their countries, in their context. 
Um, and maybe they'll do it better than we do it. But uh, to me, um, freedom of speech, freedom of the press and so forth are sort of natural uh, rights that people should want. And in fact, most of the time actually do want uh, in their countries, irrespective of how great, you know, American or French or British society is today. Well, this has been a fantastic uh, discussion, Tom. So, you know, you've obviously been steeped in this for a long time. And, you know, so now back to the title of your book, having studied how Russia loses, what are some of the recommendations you have for the Western countries or Western leaders? I think the first thing I would say is to judiciously assess uh, Russia's alliance with top power brokers in, in various countries. Uh, the, the, the Russians try to uh, uh, make common cause with, uh, with the top elites in different countries. And we have to uh, recognize that some leaders' support for Moscow is mainly rhetorical. Um, and we, we can't get in a situation where um, every time some leader says something that uh, is pro-Russian, we declare him an enemy. Um, uh, it is hard to, you know, do nothing when when some national leader um, comes out against Western nations and makes makes common cause with Russia. But if the threat posed by a regime is mainly nasty comments, and there are examples in this book of such situations, the best approach may be to avoid being baited. Um, mm. At the same time, um, we should be ready to use aggressive tactics when they're warranted. And I describe the the aggressive actions of the U.S. in Macedonia, some things we we did uh, regarding Nord Stream pipeline in Ukraine uh, and so forth, where uh, Western countries did take aggressive stances and were were effective uh, in doing so. I think it's important to prioritize uh, aid and trade and public diplomacy. These are really our competitive advantages. Russia has no money really for significant aid. All they can do is try to make certain elites rich. They can't really make a country prosperous. Um, uh, Russia has no inspiring economic or governance model to offer. So uh, we ought to make it clear uh, how little Russia is actually helping a country despite the rhetoric. Um, we should encourage these local pro-democracy actors that I referred to, independent journalism and so forth. Um, as I said, they, they have their problems, which I go into in the book, but they're not unfixable. We should leverage the power of laws, courts, legislative bodies, international organizations. Um, the, the Russians generally do not uh, recognize uh, the importance of laws and courts and mm -hmm. international organizations. Uh, but as I show in the case studies, in many cases, they have actually run afoul of these things and it's, it's, it's affected the success of their information operations. And then we can also profit from Russia's conflicting goals. Um, the, in, in many countries, uh, Russia is trying to do two or three contradictory things at once. In Germany, they were uh, they had this sweet sugary campaign to support the uh, Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, they give all sorts of money to schools and musical groups, and they built a, a wonderful roller coaster uh, at one of the German theme parks. Yet at the same time, they were hacking the Bundestag, and they assassinated a, a Chechen dissident within two miles of Angela Merkel's office. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to we need to bring out some of these these contradictory things that that people often don't uh, uh, don't don't recognize. Mm, yeah, fascinating stuff. So, um, uh, you know, this is one of those like like wrap up questions. But um, you know, wh what would you say is like your your uh, overwhelming or, or or key takeaway regarding uh, Russian influence, at least as of the middle of November, twenty twenty three. Well, I suppose the biggest takeaway is uh, do not panic. Uh, a lot of the power of the Kremlin's influence comes from people believing that its influence is powerful. And the case studies in the book show that Russia does not always succeed. Um, uh, but the myth 
that Russia is invincible is a Russian asset in itself. So uh, that's that's the key message here. Although uh, Putin's Russia has often accomplished its goals, other outcomes are possible. Um, we can learn to recognize the kinds of Russian behavior uh, that have led to the Kremlin's failures and then exploit that knowledge to, to counter Russian influence if we have the initiative and the courage to do so. All right. Well, fantastic wrap up and uh, congratulations on your new book, Tom. And with that, Tom Kent, thank you so much for being a guest on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.